Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Donna Conwell. My name is Kelly Seacat and we're the hosts of Scratch Space. Scratch Space is a virtual forum hosted by the Lucas Artist Residency Program at Montavo Arts Centre. We bring together visual artists, scholars, composers, activists, writers and others to explore what kinds of radical imaginaries can unfold in this moment of pandemic, racial reckoning, economic uncertainty, civil unrest and environmental crisis. We're interested in how we think about what's possible and how we can use our imaginations to build better present and a better future and how we can retool and create better and more equitable models for living and working together. So Donna, tell us about our speakers today. Well, I'm very excited. Today, we're going to be talking with Lex Brown and Christina Wong. Um, Lex is an artist, musician and writer, and her work is informed by the omnipresence of data information and media and how it uh, conditions our bodies and words. Um, Christina is a performance artist, a comedian, a writer and an elected representative. And her work often tackles themes regarding race, sex and privilege. We're going to be talking about the relationship between reality TV and real life and performance art and politics and what role humor can play in helping us to imagine a better world. <clears throat> that sounds great. So both Lex and Christina's bios and websites have been posted in the chat. There's a lot to get to. I'm going to disappear and leave Donna, Lex and Christina to talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll come back and see if there's any questions from our audience. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Kelly. See you soon. <laughs> So hello to um, Lex and Christina. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today for Scratch Space. Um, I'd just like to start by asking you, about how are you both doing and how are you coping with this moment? And I'm wondering, why don't we start with you, Christina, because you've been oh. channeling your energies <laughs> in this mass manufacturing force right of aunties. So why don't you? Uh, there's, this has been awesome. such... It's like I think there's there's definitely a what are you, what did you do on your coronation and uh, oh oh god oh god <laughs> can I say first I'm I'm kind of still recovering from the debate a couple of days ago like I have watched hundreds of hours of performance art in my lifetime and even I found that unwatchable because mm -hmm. I was just like you know and I have watched terrible terrible shit like just someone crawling on a gallery floor t two days straight pee -pee pooing and peeping in a, a bucket you know and I don't know I've just seen crazy stuff and this was so unwatchable so anyway okay. like that was a moment I had where I was like wow we're really going out of business as performance artists um, <laughs> but anyway yeah so <laughs> well, it's Coping is a word, I guess, that can be used. But what, uh, so I'll, uh, a little backdrop is uh, a few things have been happening since March. One is my stage show, Christina Wong for Public Office, which is about how I ran uh, for local elected office here in Koreatown, Los Angeles. It was going to be this big raucous rally that was going to tour live uh, and be this kind of commentary that would happen alongside all the real rallies that we should be at right now. Um, mm -hmm. Now I have transitioned that to, to completely perform in my house. So that's my kitchen. That's my set. That's my stairwell. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's not how anyone ever dreamed of doing their work, but we have an election coming up. And to me, I created this show, the idea behind the show a few years ago was artists and politicians have switched jobs. Mm -hmm. They now create the shock and spectacle that have us questioning reality. We as artists reclaim the earnestness, which is crazy, and the quiet space for social change and truth. So um, I was like, I'm just gonna have to run for office because I feel like any kind of piece I can do about this moment will never kind of stab it the same way just really inserting myself in this way has. So I'm in the elected yeah. representative of my neighborhood council in Koreatown. And I still go, we still do meetings on Zoom. I do the show about the experience here, but I've also started a mask making group called the Auntie Sewing Squad, um, which uh, 
just started right when this outbreak started because there was not enough PPE. Government was not prepared. And, and there were nurses being told, and they told me, they would message me, they'd find me. And they were like, I heard you sew masks. Uh, our hospital's telling us to sew tie bandanas around our face because we're just running out. So um, it was just originally a solo effort. I started to organize people online thinking this will be a two to three week stopgap. It is now over six months into this pandemic and we're, we're doing full on relief vans to Navajo Nation, to other indigenous communities. We are still sewing masks for uh, migrants at the border, day laborers, farm workers, um, very poor communities of color. Um, basically every population that the federal government wasn't really taken care of before all this and certainly is not now mm. so and that's that all is the, a lot all you the, have a yeah, lot all the stuff on the floor is the mask i have to hide all the mask making stuff so i could do the show on top this is a disaster but it's what it is and yeah. i've never seen artists like have to pick up the slack of the government so much as i have in right. this moment yeah, and then, and then you, sorry, Lex. I've been totally like we don't well, even know what Lex's deal is now. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about like um, in previous conversations, like the kind of exhaustion of carrying all of this and the burnout factor, and it was making me think, Lex, about you and some of the videos and thoughts you've been sharing on Instagram and, and your website, like when you posted in May about depression, and then your April video about finding relief in life again, and you know you've elsewhere and maybe before the pandemic I think you posted this really interesting question about how do you traverse the echo chamber of contemporary fear as a sensitive person beyond just self-care and so I'm just yeah I'd love to see kind of hear how you're doing and your sort of reflections around that I personally found those videos really helpful so thank you for sharing them. <laughs> yeah, um... So I'm doing well. I'm actually in a new apartment. I moved last week. So uh, I also, I might have to run upstairs. I realize in the middle of our conversation and get my power cord because I'm learning where the outlets are. <laughs> okay. in the apartment, maybe metaphorically, I'm like learning where the power is um, in a personal way. And so this summer I, did a few projects on online, but like the vast majority of people was just kind of, uh, you know, you'd like wake up one day and like really truly never know how the day was gonna go, how you're gonna feel, are you gonna be able to, there's an ambulance going by, are you gonna be able to like make it through the day without bursting into tears or just feeling totally uh, unmoored from time space, mm -hmm. all the things that we now deeply intimately uh, know that we we hold on to for just our sense of reality. So one way that I, I, I guess, kind of processed it, but it, it was interesting because, so the video, the Finding Belief in Life Again, I decided to make this audio essay i would call it um it's like a spiritual audio essay and i just felt inspired to make it um but also i had been asked to do a project for kunsthal stavanger which i was supposed to do a live performance there in norway in june that got canceled or postponed and um so i turned that audio essay into like a video kind of like with these a visualizer with these like butterflies and waterfalls in this black background and that was kind of an interesting thing for me to make because it really exists um similar to how i think about my youtube channel in this place that's like not completely like my practice pra my practice but it's definitely my practice mm. but it's, it's not I don't know it's in this this other like digestive space um and i'm a very spiritual person and think of my work as always having a kind of spiritual uh, package around it even if other people can't see it uh but this was like the first time i really made something very purposefully, publicly uh, talking about spirituality in connection with nature. Mm. And then I also 
made a, a longer Instagram video and also an essay that I wrote on the, on Instagram uh, right as the George Floyd protests were starting. That also puts some of these ideas about, um, I mean, thinking about just current events and as well as uh, how those current events connect to longer, very long timelines in history, how those long timelines in history connect to like literally being on a planet, mm. which is like, a great reckoning that I don't know who doesn't really understand that, but I think if we, everyone really understood that, our planet would be, we would just be in a much different um, situation. So, so that's what those um, writings and kind of talking about depression and anxiety were for me. So as much as it's like cathartic for me too, it's also, I, I just always feel the more people talk about their internal emotional landscape, the better. Um, yeah, I, I really agree with that. Um, yeah, and kind of going back to this idea around, you know, self-care and this sort of feeling of there's a great urgency, I feel this sort of great sense of urgency right now. Um, but how do you keep replenishing yourself? And um, it made me think of also a post you, you posted, I think quite recently about an exhibit you had at the Delhi Gallery where you said it was like therapy to, soci to socialize organically in a group. And then I was thinking about something, Christina, you said about working with a group of aunties and this sort of allyship that developed between all of you and how um, you know, this could be a, a kind of good model for us as to think about as kind of cultural workers as beyond just like push, 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 completely draining yourself, then needing to ramp up to the next yeah. thing that you need these kind of ongoing systems. There are, yeah, I, I will say that not that I want this pandemic to go on for over and forever, but there are some moments of pause and reflection that I wish would stick with us beyond this. Like the fact that we are beginning to wonder what are we doing to our planet? Like, mm -hmm. um, why are we valuing uh, the economy over human lives? Like, you know, things that I would have thought were basic questions, but we're, mm -hmm. we're actually <laughs> stopping to ask this. And then when I look at our group, the Auntie Sewing Squad, we have a very, the reason why we've been able to sustain ourselves for so long is because of the connections and care that we don't just churn our, like the joke is that we're a sweatshop and factory and I'm the evil overlord, like, the, um, and I am the overlord, but like, I'm, I'm not evil, I'm quite charming. But like that I, uh, that, that we also have this whole care system built in that aunties can get a pizza delivery. They can, they, they send little gifts to each other. They, they send reassurance, they send, um, they're, they're very social with each other, at least online in this group. And, um, and there's something about that, uh, while we rely on capital to do our work, our capital mostly is labor and fabric and elastic. Like at the, at the top of this thing, like you, could, you couldn't throw money at this problem. People were like giving me all this money to like provide masks, but it came down to my time on a sewing machine to make those masks. Like you could not buy your, we still can't seem to buy ourselves out of the situation, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but really what was most valuable was the labor and, uh, and, and people. And, and so we had to really put value behind that. And I, that's something kind of beautiful that like I've made all these friendships and connections with folks that in any other situation, I would have never met them, or maybe I would have felt competitive with them. I would, my, maybe I would have met them in a, an audition situation or something like that. But like in this situation where I'm connected with people through the spirit of generosity, it's been really incredible and incredibly healing for all of them too, in this time of just constant trauma. Right. So there are things that, that are worth taking forward. Just this whole situation is bad, but <laughs> I mean, you know, and like, it sounds like Lex, like the things that Lex is reflecting on are incredible, right? Like you, were you, were you having those reflections before all, before yeah, all this? Yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, it, none of the reflections are new, but I think there's a big difference between coming to a, a personal understanding for yourself and then understand and then doing something with that or communicating it, uh, allowing somebody else to access it. And so I think all of the 
like realizations were very crystallized already but there's a different kind of yeah a different way in which things can be acted upon and I also think um a large part of self-care is a sense of permission for yourself and uh, an understanding like even if you intellectually understand that like giving yourself per permission to do something gives other people permission to do that understanding that isn't the same as then actually doing the thing that that then uh, sparks a change like an actual change in yeah. one's life or other people's lives um so i th that's that was like kind of the new part of things and i agree that it's as, as terrible as so many things are there's also this element of just being in a pressure cooker where just it's so relentless that when there are uh like whether it's like a thought pattern or uh, a relationship or a, a, work, a type of job or some kind of labor or food or whatever that's not working, it's like it has to go because it's, it's so in, intolerable right now to mm -hmm. have anything that is like working against your highest good as like cliche as that sounds but like I, I feel like that's very profoundly what we're all experiencing is like that bad stuff I don't use the word bad it's not really like that but the um it's kind of toxic and they just have to go like it's all gotta go and our pre-conversation when we were t were speaking uh you know just about our our work and how we were going to talk about all of this that kind of just reminds me of the moment, maybe this is like a lead in Donna, but into uh, just thinking about like a world without white supremacy and like mm -hmm. how much, just how, I, I guess what I'm con still working through, even though I kind of know it is just like, wow, like how much of how badly we each all feel like on an individual level, whether that's things from like childhood or things that your family says to you or, a way you're treated in your workplace like how much of that is from a, a model of white supremacy that you know is and thinking about white supremacy as just like the a particular type of power a particular type of oppression a particular type of um self-hatred on like a global scale because that's what i think it is really and it you know just so happens to have been tied with like a colonial force from western europe but the actual nature of that energy is like what feels like it's just it's just gotta go like everywhere yeah and i mean we we talked quite a bit about this sort of failure of imagination right and I was thinking about the writer, social activist, Adrienne Marie Brown and her book, Emergent Strategies, when she talks about how we're engaged in an imagination battle and we're kind of living in a world that someone else dreamt up. Um, and that this, this isn't like an outdated imagination and it can't hold us anymore. So how we kind of dream our way into this new reality beyond these oppressive constructs. And I, I mean, I'd love to look at that a little bit in terms of your work if that's okay um sure and um i was thinking that um maybe we could start with um with you lex um and you know you've you've talked a bit about your practice and we have like a clip of a work that we'd like to show but um you know i, I recall reading you say somewhere that your work is sometimes described as absurd but it would be more accurate to call it the minutes of a meeting that contains so much information that any attempt to summarize it only seems laughable or log illogical, which I love. I love that description. And um, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that or whether we should go into sharing the clip from Focaccia Town Reloaded and then 
have some conversation. Um, I'll just say before we show the clip, um, yeah. everybody watching that Focaccia Town Reloaded is the sequel to a performance that I wrote and performed in 2017 um, as my thesis for my MFA. And both performances are 40 minutes to an hour long. And the first one is about a nuclear family that runs a military base slash fast casual bakery chain called Focaccia Town in the Midwest in a medieval future and uh, centers around a family that's uh, a mother, a father, and a daughter. The daughter's name is Brioche. And in the performance, you find out why her name is Brioche and uh, what uh, led to her be having that name. And um, her mother is the head of marketing, her father is a war general, and they are visited at their house by a mysterious stranger who is then um, shot for having a bag of chips. And Brioche has to bring him back to life and find out who he is. And then in the sequel, the entire plot line from the first show is condensed into 20 minutes. And then there's a retelling of the narrative through the eyes of a newscaster named Melanie. And so this clip is of uh, when you f we first see Melanie enter into um, the performance. I play okay. all the characters, so I refer to them in like third person by their names, but it's all just oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> like, then Brioche says, <laughs> Melanie says, it's really just me. <laughs> right, um, okay. So okay. Let's, um, let's play that clip now. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk some more. Is this my good side? Left or right? Am I centered? Okay. Hi. I'm ready. Hi, I'm Melanie, reporting live from Focaccia Town, where an unnamed man, unidentified, has just been shot in the home of Ariel Bold. And as Colonel Antoine, 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 we're going to be going live into the case. But first, I mean later, a story about cream, the powder drug made from the milk of dogs that's sweeping the nation. But first, the exclusive footage. <laughs>
going to just stop there. Um, this is um, an, a really incredible performance. And um, I, I recommend that you all watch the whole the full video. We'll post the link in the um, in the uh, in the chat so you can see the whole thing. Um, but I, you know, I, re I remember reading Lex, you mentioning that this Focaccia Town came kind of out of a response to grappling with how mainstream news coverage was covering police brutality towards black and brown Americans and also kind of processing what it meant to have a president with a 15, 15 season long track record of producing reality TV. Um, I, one thing that really strikes me as was really great at the end, you get the sense that there's a complete data overload. Like no one is really able to process what's happening. Everyone's getting distracted by social media and new marketing initiatives. And Melanie keeps asking, um, what are we gonna do with the evidence? At the same time, she's saying, let's just forget it all. And it made me think about where you've talked about how the media kind of conspires to render us powerless. So anyway, I just think it's a really terrific, very thought provoking piece and love to hear more of your, you know, reflections on that. I think you're muted right now, Lex, sorry. Let me see if I can unmute you. Um, I wrote the piece in 2006, end of 2016, early 2017, but it had started as a monologue that I made in spring of 2016. And the monologue was from Ariel's perspective and she was casually having brunch with a friend and talking about her baby that was like in an incubation tank and also this house party that they had at her house where um, a man was shot for bringing a bag of chips to the party. And that like central um, plot point came about from thinking about police brutality against black and brown people um, and how many of those cases somebody had been carrying an item of food in their pockets mm -hmm. that was presumed to be a gun. So of course, Trayvon Mar Martin had the bag of Skittles. Um, mm -hmm. There was also a young man named Alex Nieto who was shot and killed. Um, I, I can't remember the exact number. I wanna say it was 21 times. I'm not exactly sure. It's eight or 21, either way, it's more than zero. So. Mm -hmm. Um, excessive force was applied and he had a burrito in his pocket and I actually I did a, a another project a smaller project where I wrote to the man who called him called made the police call I and uh, I, I got an email from him I didn't pursue it further but I he he uh, it, I displayed that email in an exhibition um, really see kind of like the nuanced psychosis of <laughs> like I would say like low grade psychosis in the same way a lot of us have low grade anxiety of somebody who would call the police in that situation. Um, so I was thinking about that project about um, all of these cases of people who have been unjustly killed, but then also thinking about um, just the way nations and countries are organized and how it would seem like in the future, maybe they'd be organized by wine terroirs instead. And so the mm. idea that at this party in this monologue that bringing a bag of chips was so offensive because it just, it revealed like where you're from, your neighborhood or the state um, and being um, either poorer or of a different ethnicity and therefore dangerous. So there's a lot of kind of backstory to the world of Focaccia Town that is not explicit in, in the performance. Um, but one of the things is that, so the, the man Andre Clay Hannibal, which is like a, a mashup of like lots of my um, deceased male relatives names, um, who all uh, didn't die because of police violence, but um, I kind of wanted to like insert their history as black men, maybe perhaps black men who got to live the fullness of their lives. 
um, and just died for health reasons. But um, so his story is that he's from a, a place that's called the jungle, which is like formerly New Jersey and kind of like a section of like the Northeast. Um, and in Focaccia town, they're in what was formerly the Midwest. So that's one of the things that is um, not over in the storyline. Um, but in the first version of Focaccia town, there is kind of more discussion of like these trade routes for different like spices, like paprika and like milk. Um, foods that are really hard to get, foods that to in like today we don't think of them being uh, inaccessible in the United States. Although in the time since I made Focaccia Town and now in, in like COVID, that has actually changed a lot. And mm -hmm. um, so that's part of the world of it. And and um, in making this second version, I, I wanted to complicate the levels of i mean it's already kind of complicated because i'm playing all these different characters but i still wanted to complicate like the levels of narration so there's actually th three levels or there are like three narrators in this second version of focaccia town there is um the piece starts off with these time travelers who are in in a kind of uh, unspecified, even more deep future time. And they are traveling from point G to point H. Um, by the end of the show, you understand that point from point A to point B is like the moment that we're in now where it going from pre-colonial world to a colonial world. And just we're, we're trying to get from point A to point B, but there's like an entire alphabet of time that we can traverse as, as people. So so their job, these two narrators, is to patch the holes in the time continuum. And they are revisiting the story of Focaccia Town because Melanie's news broadcast has completely warped the truth. So in this the version that we just watched, um, it keeps going on. And as Melanie keeps manipulating the story, um, the brother who was once the victim uh, turns into... Uh, the aggressor in the crime and and mm -hmm. gradually Antoine who is the uh Barashi's father who originally shoots um Andre Antoine becomes the victim and he's on his knees like begging to God on all that is like holy and right and mm -hmm. uh, the group of people who are coercing Melanie they're called the crusade so uh definitely some like uh Christian crusade sort of undertones as we know like so much of our I think so much of our our world is uh yeah it's said in the future but it seems yeah. like uh con controlled by that you know some people will like Illuminati stuff but oh a uh, recommendation for a documentary to watch on Netflix is The Family if you haven't seen it it's crazy um but it talks about these sort of like judeo-christian power structures which are super interesting to me because there's like that the spiritual element that's very like real like when people talk about how, like kind of like alchemy of like thought into reality but then the question of like how that's actually used to you know dictate what society looks like is there's a lot of issues there so yeah yeah, I mean, it's said in, in, the, in the future, but it's so timely, all of the issues and, that you raise. And, um, you know, particularly thinking about the role that media is playing in all of this and our kind of inability to come to a, a consensus on what's really happening. <laughs> um, but I'd like to turn now, if I could, to, before we get into some more cross-talk, to um, Christina. Um, you know, and this sort of world building that, Lex is describing character creation. I mean, this is very much kind of in your world house and, you know, your work includes performance and comedy where you're taking up different identities and personas that are kind of loose, based on per maybe personal or semi-personal experiences, loosely maybe. Um, but you've also worked as an actress in soap operas and um, you've also been a commentator, you, you're elected representative, you're straddling all of these different 
kinds of identities from artistic to political to media worlds. So, I mean, it's very interesting. I'd love to hear more about how you inhabit all of these identities and how that relates to what you're interested in. Yeah, I mean, I, I often describe that I play a character named Christina Wong and uh, and it's a persona and it helps me deal with hate mail, especially when I like, uh, we're going to show a clip of Radical Cram School, but uh, Alex Jones of Infowars and his following like just seized upon choice clips of it and we're like, there's a school, there's a communist indoctrination school for children. This is really happening, and then I'm like, no, it's a web series, dumb dumb. Like, and <laughs> and and it, it it got the attacks became so personal. But what helped me was go, okay, they're just mad at the character. They're mad at the character because it's like it's how I can function, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it is like understanding that this face, when it enters the space, seems fairly harmless and non-threatening to people, and people really react when I become threatening, when I challenge them, right? And um, I can trace like every every upset email I've gotten to usually a white man who has an Asian wife and doesn't believe I'm supposed to be behaving this way or has an Asian girlfriend and doesn't believe I'm supposed to behave this way and um, and and so they just seize in so uh, that was like a quick overview of stuff I've done but yeah I I think so much of uh, me playing myself is me trying to understand who I am supposed to be in the world mm -hmm. um, because the sort of history laid out for me of, of <laughs> how to be me was like be a doctor, Miss Chinatown, um, married to a Chinese doctor who plays the piano, is quiet, doesn't rock the boat, um, just is very successful and rich on her own merit without having to challenge anyone of their power to get that, get those things, right? And that's not who I am. And uh, so much of every show is about me sort of constantly challenging all that and figure out who I am in this. Um, I will also say I do play uh, a flawed martyr in a lot of my work, um, even in running for office. It was like, yeah, I'm going to fix this. Um, mm -hmm. My show before this, the Wall Street Journal was me going to Uganda to do microloan volunteer work. And that sort of turned itself upside down. And I had to confront a lot of my own um, internal biases and also sort of like, what was I expecting to happen if uh, showing up as an American volunteer in uh, East Africa? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, a lot of trying to figure out where to throw humor in this is like, just so I don't totally reagonize myself or my audience is, is constantly posing the question, well, what's good about the situation? Even if it's like the shittiest situation ever, I go, what's good about this? <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and, and and having some distance from myself and trying to imagine myself as just like a, well, maybe I'm just a Don Quixote right now and I just don't know what's happening. And, and this is how I make fun of myself in this moment. Yeah. Um, so this, um, you know, your latest role is elected representative. Well, that's real, but then you're also- It's real, yes. You're and playing it, right, as yes. well. Yeah. As and well, yes, as I, I would say that all politicians are definitely they're <laughs> performing harder than any performance artist. Like they are very aware of every hand they shake, every endorsement they make, everything that comes out of their mouth. They are in ways more like you. These celebrities have groomers that like, and, and PR people and politicians are like in that, in that. way more, mm -hmm. um, and so conscious of every of symbolism and gestures. So. Yes. So uh, yeah, that's the latest role I play is as an elected official, which I really do serve and I really do work uh, and labor uh, that is volunteer in that capacity. Um, yeah, but I think at the same time, it feels like a piece of performance art. We can, we can show a clip. Of yeah, should we show, show, we show like, the trailer? Yeah, let's show the trailer. So the trailer is mostly a marketing piece. So I can't really, my memory is so shot what's in this. But yeah, you can at least see how this played out for a live audience and try to imagine how it plays out here in my living room. Okay, here we go.
message. My vision for making Koreatown a safe haven for all immigrants, my mission to protect the most vulnerable. It was all that, but it was especially my ability to pass as Korean! <laughs> I want to see you too, Lex, in person. I think what when um, Lex and I have in common is like this obsessive, uh, obsessive obsessiveness around reality television and how it informs our work. And um, so that can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I would love to talk about that. I, I I've been obsessed with reality television um, since I've like especially the Flavor of Love Dynasty, which was. Flavor Flav's dating series. He got three seasons. He had a kid with his real life girlfriend between seasons two and three, and yet still proceeded to shoot that. And 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 uh, I, I loved watching The Apprentice as well. I didn't want that. I didn't want us to all be in the spinoff of The Apprentice, which is what we are in now. But um, I was really interested in uh, the editing and persona and how people like they they didn't get eliminated because they were still interesting enough, and how we see parallels of that playing out. In government now, I actually had a reality television pilot uh, that uh, I tell the story of this in the show that True TV and Lionsgate were producing, and and if they liked the pilot, they would order it for an entire season. And and at that point, I think I was about 38 years old, so I was like, oh my god, this is this is like my last chance to like have my own TV show because women are already supposed to be dead at 30 in Hollywood. So like I was already an anomaly, but the show was basically me as a naive activist, which is like a Nathan for you meets Michael Moore, um, uh, trying to fix the injustices of the world. But there was all these issues with trying to shoot this pilot. Like there's certain words that they were still scared of, right? That there's certain things that weren't good for sponsors to say. And it, and it was really, hard to figure out this persona, which to me felt so clear when Obama was still president. And and this pilot, by the way, I pitched and uh, sold the pilot when Obama was president, but then we had to shoot when Trump took office. And by the time Trump, Trump took office, like everything just seemed like wackadoodle. And like, I felt like such, like this character I was playing felt so much like a liability uh, to anything that I actually cared about. Uh, and it felt like a liability to the left. It felt like a liability to activists. It felt like a liability to all so social justice to have um, a character that was a little clueless and self-absorbed and going forward. And and so the so we shot the, this pilot. I thought it was all right, um, given the circumstances <laughs> and who I was able to hire and uh and and what i was like the parameters of what i was like allowed to say in this pilot i didn't they didn't buy it obviously and that's where i found myself having a very trump moment of like i don't have a reality tv show what do i do with myself right now i guess i run for office 
right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, <laughs> and that's and then like I'm just so obsessed with the seamless journey of folks in the White House who are now on reality TV, or they just immediately it's like a it's a weird showcase, like a stepping stone for your book deal, or stepping stone for your Fox news commentator, whatever, or Dancing with the Stars or Big Brother, right? And and it just sort of, yeah. it, it's so strange, right? Um, yeah, Alex, you- how fame is built. Yeah, Lex, you, you've also talked about this a little bit and, you know, you mentioned about um, tr struggling to, to write something when everything feels like a farce. Um, so I was wondering, maybe you could talk a bit about your reflections of this sort of reality TV experience we, we are in right now. Yeah, as Christina was talking, I'm just like shaking my head and like typing enthusiastically, like, yes, yes. <laughs> um, things were so much more clear um, four years ago, very much uh, easier to conceive of satire, irony, um, mm -hmm. It, it it's I, I think maybe I mean now maybe it's it's again easier because it's I don't know if it's easier but it's it's a little bit it's clearer but it's still like uh mm. yeah it's hard to it's hard to make fun of certain things when it's just so bad <laughs> and uh, yeah I find myself watching comedy for the earnestness, like, and, and that comedy used to be like, oh, I'm wacky, I'm making sounds. And now it's more like, no, just give me someone who can just, just cut through all this shit and just give it. So I find myself watching Colbert or John Oliver, like just to like, and I'm finding them leaning into a certain mm -hmm. earnestness, which I think is interesting, right? Um, yes. And needed. Yeah, and that's a flip too, totally a flip. like the whole transition of Colbert from being like this like satirical news show into like now just kind of like straightforward news reporting with a few jokes to like keep you from going yeah. crazy. Because all of like the um, major news media is is so, ah, just, well, there's, there's not a lot of information in there or like useful information. Like I, I the, the whole like concept of the news cycle is just, I don't know, just reminds me of like cereal boxes or something. <laughs> it should be like a full course meal. They could put a lot more information, I think, in there. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it's, it was, it's, it's tricky. I, I mean, I also think about, um, maybe you can relate to this too, Christina, like playing with stereotypes and different things that I've, uh, I, I've studied clown for like a long time. And there's certain parts of like physical comedy that are just, they're just funny. And there's certain parts of like costuming and uh, humorous costume that like accentuate hair or like different parts of your body. And it's, it's, yeah, it's funny. But then when those things line up with certain like stereotypes, you can like find yourself yeah in just a place that feels really unfair that as like a person of color, as a woman of color, um, that that there's somehow a place that's like off limits when if you were in a different body, you could make a fool of yourself in a way where it wouldn't like reflect back on your culture. It would just be, we can look at the, um, the spirit of the humor itself. And mm -hmm. that is really hard to find that space. Maybe it's subconsciously one of the reasons why uh, Focaccia Town ended up being all these different characters because then at least there, it doesn't all collapse onto you. Like the character doesn't, mm -hmm. people can like distinguish like, oh, this is a character. And if then there's another character that this performer is playing, they're able to see uh, the differences between the characters in relief, as opposed to it just being about you 
making fun of yourself and also in like a human people a lot of people I, maybe it's just like in visual art that they still connect like hum i think like humiliation or like failure with comedy a lot and mm -hmm. there is a lot in failure that is funny and a, like and there are many like types of humor that are funny because of like failure but but i don't know i get frustrated by this idea that as an artist who's succeeding in portraying failure that you're somehow failing when you're actually being successful in uh like in a particular craft what i feel i'm hearing that you're saying or at least i'm projecting on what you're saying is as like a body like a marginalized body when i do something like clown or 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 and playing a character making fun of myself there is a huge swath of audience who's never seen anyone like me before I guess and and just takes it at face value like oh she really did screw up oh she is a she's this is stress like they don't like I don't think I'm that bad at making fun of myself but I do think that that in the larger narrative of people's lives that people can't understand that I've had a full narrative with nuance and things and that I also have the capacity to make fun of myself much the same way a white comedian or actor can make fun of themselves that's what I'm projecting I don't know if I was yeah this, Lex. <laughs> yeah 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 that's totally I, yeah that's a big yeah that's definitely a big part of it it's like uh there's just certain like characters that i feel like it's you have to we have to like go like extra step to like show it's a character or like yeah. show a character mm -hmm. as being funny beyond uh like social politic around it i know we can never yeah but it's like also at the same time the whole point of making art is to make things that help us yeah. with those um boundaries or those like yeah boxes. i mean what felt very clear to me um the the sort of and you mentioned it in the comments is that we were able to understand sat satire more or at least i was when obama was president now we have to be so earnest like we can't pretend to be the dumb one and that was a that was sort of a trope i think that was very common it's like the, the Michael Scott from The Office or like the, the naive white guy. And I think there were comedians of color who tried to take on like the naive, not woke enough person of color because there was a culture that there were enough woke people that we felt like we could make fun of that, right? And now it's just like, we hands off, like they're gonna take that sound clip and you, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they're gonna, you know, use it against you much as like what happened with me in Radical Cram School. Like those, those clips of, we were thrown right back at me as like, oh, you're running a communist uh, school for kids. And I'm like, wait, what? Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. And and it's sort of, the, the real comedy is in this earnestness, which is how the world is turned upside down. So interesting. Um, <laughs> we're kind of running a little bit out of time. There's so much more that we could talk about here. <laughs> And yeah. a lot more work that I wanted us to share, but um, maybe we can bring Kelly back in now and um, see, see Kelly. questions from our audience. Um, questions from Kelly. We may have lost Lex. It may be. Oh, okay. I'm still here. I just, I had to change location. Oh, yes, the plugin. Yeah, the plug. I thought that whole, so that whole discussion <laughs> that you just had about the role of comedy and humor now is just really, really fascinating. And um, I was thinking back a little bit to the earlier question you had about um, imagination and imagining what's possible and um, wondering what your thoughts are about humor and comedy's role in that process of reimagining things. Does it play a role or no? I mean, we need it. We need it. Well, we need to imagine something else, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think we. This is a, an amazing moment for artists to, 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 to both realize. Like I think I, I've, I've become very clear that oh, like we can't wait for the government to save us. There are structure that's in place, but as someone who's literally running a shadow government aid agency right now called the Anti Sewing Squad, like it has become very clear to me that. Uh, and I'm watching even like um, white theater institutions, they're, 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 they're freaking out and panicking about how, because they're being called out on, um, on, on 
their embedded white supremacy in, in a system that relied on very rich white donors and only programmed mostly white artists on their stage, right? And so we we have this moment to sort of reimagine, and I think it is about taking the reins. This is a little bit of a Lord of the Flies moment where we just like, <laughs> I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I mean, like, this sounds so chaotic, but this is, I think what it is culturally is that because we can't meet in spaces, we got we we have to take some initiative and lay out uh, some vision of what we want. Because as I'm watching these theaters flail with like, how do we issue a BLM solidarity statement? And like, they and then looking to their staff of color to help them figure that out. It's like, mm. yeah, they have no answers. And so it's like, this is a moment where especially I think artists of color need to step up and go, okay, well, this is the world that we want. Mm. These are, and mm -hmm. are you gonna come with me or not, you know? Um, but yeah, this I see I'm so grim. I feel like I'm uh uh what do I call it? I, I couldn't compare myself to like an army general that's like constantly talking to the troops, except the troops are my aunties, and I'm like, okay, we're gonna be in this for a year and a half, but this is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna take care of each other, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna keep taking care of each other. But like, yeah, that's the bonkersness of this moment is is everyone in, all hands on deck. Right. Take the lead. Lex, what do you have? <laughs> I, I'm thinking about um, when you're talking about white institutions having like a freak out moment, um, thinking about a recent Zoom call at uh, one of the schools that I'm teaching at and going through just a really painful <laughs> such a painful meeting about like anti-racism uh and a conversation that just really quickly found it's a way away from racism and into like let's just talk about like how to i don't know let's translate this into like the most the most kind of administrative thing that's not really where any of the problem is and the drudgery of that meeting and i was talking in the in the zoom uh that this is at harvard i was talking in the zoom with one of my the other faculty members who was a person of color uh just about you know like uh, like why is this meeting getting so off topic wish it was more fun i think i said to the whole chat like let's make anti-racism fun because it is and I, I think there's like this really big problem with um, the way a lot of these these initiatives are like communicated. Like we're all getting these emails that we've been getting for the last two months from, you know, it's a museum or a school or something about like, here's what we're doing. And it's like this long block of text that you don't want to read and you kind of already know what it says because it's not really unique because it's not really understood it's it's actually just kind of like performative language and mm -hmm. i understand that people are are trying to do the best they can and also that like no literally nobody is like an expert in this because none of us have done it yet like that's the moment that we're in like we're all trying to figure out how to to get to point B. And so I, I thought of that and just about how um, like anti-racism work should be fun because like racism's not fun. And <laughs> it's just not fun. It's not, it's not. And it, and racism, <laughs> the whole point of racism is like, it really like subjugates lots of the things that we know to be fun. Like, like, different cultures <laughs> mm -hmm. food music life um and so i think that humor can play a really important role in 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 this transformation because we have to remember that we're going to a better place and that it's going to feel better and that it's okay to let go of like the terrible and like shitty way that things have been and they also think that there is uh, and also, yeah, with humor, I think humor is really important because humor alleviates the sense of guilt that a lot of white people feel and also the sense of like resistance where I, I feel, at least with some of the, 
the people who I've seen in these meetings that, you know, they clam up because mm -hmm. nobody, nobody wants to be accused of like perpetrating something that's been happening for centuries. And mm -hmm. I, a really important part of the conversation that I think is often missing on like a mass level is that like, like you, you can alleviate a lot of that weight once you just say like, I don't identify with, uh, with white supremacy, like I'm, I'm not for that. I'm not about that. I am gonna keep learning. Uh, I'm gonna, you know what I mean? Like, there's all this. Uh, yeah, it's just, it just, ugh. it feels bad when it, when it, when, whenever it becomes about this thing that's like, uh, I don't know, like that it's something that we can't all change or like we all are racist we all have like white supremacist thoughts because we're all in that society so yeah. we all have to do work we you know what i mean like i just that that's the space that i i really wish to create is like one that is just a little bit more like let's start with the fact that like we're humans okay and nobody asked to be here so but we're here <laughs> literally nobody asked to be born so like that should be like the first first like acknowledgement that like you know you can't choose your body and then okay then what are you gonna do with it and i don't know that's like an easier place to begin i think um it just gives people more space because we need that like mental yeah. space I'm going to jump in here. We need to follow up on this fun in anti-racism because I've witnessed the same thing. You start talking about racism and especially the white people in the room want to close down and move out <laughs> and change the subject okay. <laughs> and sweep it away. And we're not there. So it is, you know, we all need that space. We have a question from somebody in yeah. our audience and Nathan, Maybe. I think he's going to put them through for us. Um, Nadine? Come at me. Come on, Nadine. You got a question? Come on, Nadine. Unmute yourself. Let me right. see. Maybe I can put Nadine through. Um, Nadine, you're muted. I'm trying There's to another ask. question that came in. We can uh, until Nadine gets on, which is what are our current projects? Yeah, talk a little bit about your current projects, and we'll get Nadine next. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, I run this sweatshop. I have to use that in quotes because for some of the aunties it's upsetting, but others are like, yeah, let's call it what it is because we don't want to romanticize our volunteer work. But I've been um, working on a show called Christina Wong Sweatshop Overlord on Zoom, which is just sort of a living diary that will, I guess, evolve across the course of all this. Um, uh, I, I mostly worked on it in the first month of the pandemic and I haven't touched it since. But as you know, like the pandemic has compounded and has become a racial pandemic and a, a economic and all sorts of pandemics and now mm. a democratic pandemic. Um, and, and so I'm just, just trying to create a diary, which I think is amusing, but also kind of freaked out, but like what it's been like to just run a factory with a bunch of folks I can't see um and how close i feel like i've gotten to this and i, I also wanted that to lead towards the auntie retirement party which is a which would be some sort of performative thing because we keep talking as aunties like when are we going to retire and meet each other and just celebrate and see each other's faces and i don't know if we'll ever have that moment so i want to also develop that but this idea of retiring right now because it's become clear we are patching up systemic racism with like uh, our sewing machines that us retiring isn't doesn't mean the problem went away. It just means we chose to walk away from it. So I wanted it to be about dreaming forward. What does this look like? This world where we wouldn't have had been in the situation in the first place. And what does it mean to truly let go of this specific labor that we chose to do during this time? So that's what I'm working on. Christina, will you just remind us how many aunties? You're working with we have hundreds um our group is about close to 900 but i would say about half of them have been active at some point 
and I have the craziest mental map because like with the fires in Northern California, we, we like, we found a, an auntie who lives in Napa. So we mailed her mm. KN95 medical grade masks so that she could be a distribution point to these farm worker orgs, right? Like, like we <laughs> were always like thinking like, oh, someone, some, some lady in Riverside's mother died and they're giving away all this fabric. Okay, we, do we have a way to get, you know, we have someone in Riverside who has a truck who can pick it up. And now we have a, we do have a van that's coming back from the Navajo Nation. That can, like, it's just like, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's like <laughs> the, the, the way we've had to figure out a supply chain within this broken supply chain is, is not. It's crazy, but thank you. It's pretty fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it was just, you just kind of were one of those because it's been either way for people that just snapped into action and you just started sewing. You were probably sewing on like the 14th of March. Yeah. It was sort of. almost immediate. Ugh. And so there was sort of, it went immediately into kind of a living performance or a reality. Yeah, I know. It's, um, yeah, it's Lord of the Flies. You can be Jack or you could be Ralph. Next, why don't you I, share I can't. <laughs> what you're working on now. I know there's many moving parts. That's so amazing, Christina. I admire you so much. Um, one of the reasons why I'm really glad I moved, I'm not in New York anymore, I'm in Philly. I'm, I am happy about being in a smaller city and like where things feel like more, I don't know, accessible to like actually become involved with activists here. Um, as far as what I'm working on, I'm I'm finishing editing this film that I shot in February. Um, that's called The Glass Eye, and it's about a woman who's um, she has these like multiple accounts that are like her. Um, they're not really clones; they're like individual people, but they're these multiple accounts who are are watching the the story uh, her name's Coretta they're watching they're watching the like original account like in a tv show and then they slowly realize that they are um like this the, the tv show that they're watching is real and they have to go save her so it's kind of like she's is saving herself um and it's the first time that I've worked with a full cast of people and directed it. So I only play like a very minor role in it, which is directing for the first time was really fun, deeply humbling. It's taken me a long time to edit it mostly because it's, um, I wasn't anticipating what it would be like to write something and then shoot it and then watch yourself directing people and as a first time director who's not used to that so there is a, a lot to kind of like take in with that in like literally watching hours and hours of how you communicate with other people in like a team-based setting like what how do you treat them when it's like getting late you know there's definitely moments where I really wish we, I hadn't like pushed people to like keep shooting so that's like super humbling to edit this now too um but I am trying to finish it in the next couple months because it's it's uh very much about screen space and it just it feels like I've got to get it out there uh very soon mm. um before it becomes irrelevant <laughs> there's kind of like maybe like a two year maybe period where I feel like you have an idea and then it's like wow things happen so quickly that um context changes yeah things change so so yeah. quickly that I, I hope it still uh arrives on time um, well I'm excited to see for that so let us know where we can see it in the future uh, <laughs> I want to thank you both for a really great and super rich conversation. Thank you for spending and sharing your time with us today. Um, and Kelly, I'd want to ask you if you can tell us what's coming up next week on Scratch Face. Absolutely, but I want to just join you. I want to thank you both for your work. This is a this is a challenging time, and bringing humor into this moment is it's no joke. It's really really important. These moments where we find ourselves laughing and 
and I appreciate you both so much. Christina, you need to keep us abreast of what's coming up. And Lex, again, when that film is done, let us know. Yes. yes. So next week for Scratch Space, we'll be investigating whiteness. We'll be talking about how, as white people, we can find a role in anti-racism. And in this movement, we'll be with Dorit Sippis, who pivoted immediately following George Floyd and began a whole mediation process looking at, at identity and whiteness. Um, Janet Owen Driggs will join us, as well as Gregory Sale, who's been working in this world of, of justice for many, many years. And the four of us, the five of us, will be talking about how we sort of activate ourselves in this space of anti-racism. So I hope you'll all join us. I believe Nathan's posted some of the future Scratch Space, as well as some of the past episodes in the chat. He'll put them on Facebook. And I just can't thank you both enough. I can't wait to see you in Silicon Valley, in Saratoga, yeah. in Calvo. And yeah. this will be a moment where we can rest. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you so much again for joining us. And um, we look forward to seeing everyone next week for a Scratch Space episode five. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Donna and Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you both. Yeah. I look forward to meeting you in person, Lex. No, that'll be so fun. I know we'll watch terrible reality shows together. Yes. I just bought Ben <laughs> Married at First Sight, season nine. Oh, so weird. So weird. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> we deserve everything we've given to ourselves. Like that we we got so bored that we were like, let's just put ourselves in a reality show called this <sighs> democracy. Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> the beautiful thing, the potential of reality TV is that it shows how deeply invested we can get in another person's life, even when mm -hmm. very little is happening. Yeah. Oh, and, God. And that to like turn that energy into something else other than just like watching the TV is is very powerful. It could be very powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, turning off our cameras. Thank you both very much, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you.